All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're going to be reading verses 24 through 27. Can y'all hear me okay out there? Everybody hear okay? Okay. 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. After threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, this, as we said last week, it's called the backbone of Bible prophecy. And to read it in one setting, as we have just did, without any knowledge or without any understanding, it kind of makes us back away from Bible prophecy. But as we look at it and begin to get a working idea of it, then it makes us want to know more. Now last week we talked about these verses and we taught several things in these verses, used a lot of numbers, and some of you were a little bit, uh, I don't like the word confused, but that many numbers at one time, some of you didn't feel comfortable. I know I made probably more, made more than one mistake, but one time, as I'm going over this in my mind, I think it was Sunday afternoon, I realized at some point in the message, I quoted one of the figures and said, if you subtract that from 490, you get 7. And it wasn't supposed to be subtracted, it's supposed to be added. But in my mind, I'm doing something else and sometimes, I tell Linda, sometimes I'm teaching y'all and I see something else and I'm trying to put it over here in my mind, not let it interfere right then with what I'm saying. And sometimes I get my tongue over my eye tooth and can't see what I'm about to say. <laughs> but anyway, I, I realize I made that mistake and we'll try to clear it. So today, we're not going to cover necessarily a lot of new material we're going to kind of go back before you think, well, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have come. Wait, 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 wait. We're going to go back and we've got some pictures that I think will help you to understand the process and it will help you to understand Daniel. Now then, as we started out in Daniel, we had the picture of the metal man and that helped that scripture become plain. Then we found the second vision that Daniel himself had of the man, but then as the kingdoms are identified as beast. Well, we've understood that. Now when we come to this, and we're going to put it together, Daniel will not be as hard as we thought that it was. Now then, last week, from the scripture we just read, let's talk about two or three things. Number one, we talked about the time frame. We talked about 70 weeks, which literally means 70 sevens. 
We talked about that a week in the Bible can be a week of day. It can be a week of years. It can be weeks of years. And usually the week is expounded in sevens. God works through sevens. Uh, when we studied numerology on Wednesday nights, we took the basic numbers of the Bible and identified them and found out what they mean. And then it gets interesting when you're reading your Bible and you come to a number, look back on your chart, and you begin to add it up. And sometimes you can decipher a meaning there in that scripture. And it's very interesting. So Daniel is saying there's going to be 70 weeks of 7. So 7 times 70 is 490 years of history. Now then, Daniel is getting this. He's looking forward into time. And he's understanding this is going to happen to the people of Israel. Now keep this in mind. Daniel was taken into Babylonian captivity. It was promised to be for 70 years. That 70 years are about to expire and Daniel is excited for the people that they're going to be able to go back home. But at the same time, he begins to get these visions of 490 years and he kind of more or less scratches his head and says, God, I'm totally lost. 70 years over here is coming to an end that we're supposed to go home and now you show me 490 years. And so what we've come to understand that in that first 70 years, if Israel had learned their lesson, amen, if they had learned their lesson, God could deal differently with them, but because they didn't, God says they haven't learned their lesson yet, therefore there's other things to come. In fact, God is dealing with the Jews during this time frame, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to find some interesting things. Let's move on. He said the time is 70 weeks, the people, he's dealing with the Jews. And we'll show you something else here that helps break out Bible prophecy. The place, he's talking about Jerusalem. The purpose, remember those six things that we read in verse 24? I'm not going to reread them, but you can find them there. Finish the transgression, make an end to sins, blah, blah, blah. That is the purpose of what God's going to be doing during this time to deal with the Jewish people. The program. God breaks it down into years. So he talks about seven weeks or seven times seven is 49 weeks. And he said, what starts the clock to ticking is the commandment to go back and rebuild the walls, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. You'll find this talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah chapter 2. Again, this helps you to get biblical history and background in order. So this takes place. And then he says, following that, there's three score and two. A score is 20. Three score is 60. 60 plus 2. All right, we have that, but then you add the first seven years to it, and we have 434 years. Don't panic. I'm going to show you this on a picture. So we have 49 years into 434 years, which come to 483 years. Now, last week I said subtract. This is where I messed up last week. But if you add 7 to 483, what do you get? 490. So what he's saying is, I'm showing you what I've got to do to deal with the Jewish people. So the entire prophecy is for 490 years. So 483 years. Now listen carefully. 483 years have already happened. That ought to make you say, wow. And we'll see this. 483 years of the prophecy of Daniel have already happened. We can, I do it like this, we can turn around, so to speak, and look at history. First of all, I mean, you look at the Bible, it spells it out. 
But you can look at the Bible and you can look at history and everything that Daniel had talked about in chapter 2, chapter 7, and now in chapter 9, it has happened. It has happened. So what we know then, if 483 years have happened, how many years are left? Seven, which is the tribulation period. Now, when we see this on the chart, it ought to literally make us have a different attitude toward the Bible, toward prophecy, toward studying things because it helps us to really understand. So you've been hearing preachers, some of you, for years you've been hearing preachers say, Jesus coming soon, Jesus coming soon, Jesus coming soon. And a lot of people, in fact, the book of Peter talks about many of the people begin to scoff in the last day. They'll begin to say, and they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? Where is that problem? In other words, when, how come it didn't happen? How come it hadn't happened? It's not going to happen. And they begin to uh, disfigure, if I can use that word, the Bible teaching about the second coming and about the rapture and about the end time. That's what the world wants to hear. The world wants us to believe that things are coming together and things are getting better and better. Or if you're from Arkansas, it's getting gooder and gooder. But if we understand the Bible, things are not getting better. Now, part of the world thinks they're getting better, and part of the world goes to bed at night in a panic of what's going to happen next. But the Lord Jesus Christ has told us what's going to happen next. So we're in a time frame where we're looking for things to take place. Let's look at number one. Can y'all see that pretty good? No. Now. <laughs> Just take all the pictures down, tear them up, burn them, throw them away. I'm not going to help them anymore. <laughs> That's the best we could get right now. I don't think that'll make any difference. Oh, Lord. Don't use this room. Don't use that light. That mic's too loud. Now you're too loud. I don't like praise music. I don't like hymns. <laughs> There's openings all around for pastors. Anybody? <laughs> okay. Can you see it better? Yeah. Let me tell you this. I've got a copy of this chart for you if you want it, but I didn't give it out on before the service because you had sat there and play with it and look at it. <laughs> so you're going to have to pay attention so that when you get it, don't come to me after church and say, now what happened here? I say, that's when you said you can't see. Okay, right here it says Daniel 70 weeks, Daniel 69 weeks. The first seven weeks is how many years? 49. So from here to here is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. After the walls are built, now there are 62 weeks, or 434 years from here to here. Now it says, to Messiah the Prince. During this time, can everybody see that? During this time, we have the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is when Jesus Christ is born. Then at 12 years of age, he's in the temple. Then in his 30s, he comes to John to be baptized. Then he does his three, three and a half years of ministry. Okay? Then the Bible said right here in verse 26, After three score and two, two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Who did Jesus die for? Us. Us. Not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now then, so we have 434 years up here in this second part. Again, the clock is ticking. Remember, the clock started ticking right here because they're building the walls. The clock is still ticking, but notice right there. What happened right there? I can't hear you. 
crucified. The crucifixion, Jesus died. In other words, the way the scripture says, and Messiah shall be cut off. The word cut off means put to death. The Messiah shall die. Now, during his ministry, during his ministry right through there, he goes about doing good, but remember, he's trying to emphasize to the people who, everybody say who, who he is. Who he is. Now, if you understand that, you can understand the Gospels. The Gospels spend four books introducing to the Jewish people who Jesus is. See, they were, rec or they were still thinking of, of when the Messiah comes, he's going to come riding in on a prancing white stallion. He's going to have an army following him. He's going to destroy the Romans. He's going to level out everything that's ours. The Jewish people are going to come in, take all the loot, take all the booty. They're going to establish their houses and the lands, and they're going to live in peace forever. See, they had part of the scripture and part of their thinking put together. That's how you get to number nations. Amen? People take what they want and then they take a little bit of Bible and they put it together and they come up with a whole new theory and they establish this is what we believe. Now then, during this time, Jesus is teaching. So right, I'm just using an example, right there is where he makes his triumphant entry. When he made his triumphant entry, he publicly, purposely declared, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. He came in the way that emperors would come. He came riding a donkey, which was prophesied in Zechariah. Some of the people began to hail him, hail him, hail him. They laid down the palm leaves. They were shouting. They were having a good time because they thought, well, uh, it's not a white horse, but it'll do. But the leaders, the Jewish leaders, it's always the religious people. Amen? The Jewish leaders were turned on Christ and they began to find ways to find fault with him and his ministry and through their lies and treachery they turned the people against Christ and we said it like this the crowd one moment is saying hail him, hail him the next moment they're saying in essence nail him, nail him they put him on the cross and but he died not for himself God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now then, what we're seeing then, can you go to number one? There you go. Same picture, but notice the emphasis. We're in this time frame. The 62 and the 7. In other words, we're dealing with the 483 years right here. I'm sorry, the 434 years. I get sidetracked too. We're dealing with that. Jesus goes to the cross. After the triumphant entry, he goes to the cross. Now, everybody listen real carefully. When you get your paper, you want to write this down. The clock stops. The clock stops. Let's go over this again. What happens right here? The clock starts. If it starts there, what happens here? Stop. So Daniel is seeing that God started a prophetic clock that started ticking when the command comes to rebuild the walls. But at the triumphant entry, when Jesus came in, they rejected Jesus. And to show they rejected him in their rebellion, they put him on the cross and killed him. That was the final thing. So because of that, God stopped the clock from ticking. Now then, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that's okay. Go to chart number two. Now then, same chart, but now we have the circle here. 
after the clock stops ticking, there is a time frame theologically, so it's not, when I say biblical, it's not a biblical word, but theologically, there is a undetermined time from when the clock stops to when the clock starts again. Now, we need to understand this because in this time, that says gap between the 69th and 70th week. The present dispensation of the church, and it says, was not revealed to Daniel. All Daniel saw was 490 years. Now look at it. Daniel saw from here to here, and Daniel saw from here to here. He knew nothing of the church. The Old Testament people did not know about the church. They didn't understand about the church. Jesus mentioned the church in Matthew when he said, Upon this rock I shall build my church. But the church appears to be uh, formed and organized during this time frame right here on the day of Pentecost. So the gap, it's got three or four different names. Uh, it's been called the church age. It's been called the dispensation of grace. It's been called uh, the gap. And it's not the gap of Genesis 1 and 2. But it's during the time that God is dealing with the church. Now, this is important because watch this. A lot of people, when you have the rapture take place... A lot of people, because of faulty reading and faulty understanding, try to say the church goes through the tribulation. Now, right off the bat, with no more than I've said showing these pictures, you ought to automatically have a question mark in your mind saying, that can't be. Now, some of you are saying, okay, tell me why that can't be. Because, notice, God's dealing with the Jews, 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 he stops dealing with the Jews. He starts dealing with the Jews here to here. Does everybody agree with that? So if he deals with the Jews from here to here and from here to here, he doesn't deal with them here. That's the church age. So what's interesting is, right if I had thought I could have drawn right there, right before the 70th week, if you draw an arrow right there, and write the word rapture on it going up, the rapture takes place. Once the rapture takes place, the church, the body of Christ, is called up into heaven. How can the church go through this if they're up there? See what I'm saying? Some people say, well, they go halfway through. Well, again, which half? You say the first half. Well, again, if the rapture happens here, there's no way. And then they divide it into uh, pre-wrath, all-millennial, post-millennial, no-millennial. I mean, you get into all this stuff, and it sounds good, but again, remember what I told you earlier? I believe this, and there's a scripture that says this. I'm going to take what I believe with what I think God says, and I'm going to put it together, and this is my doctrine. There are times that the Bible will disagree with us. Amen? And when we compare Scripture with Scripture, sometimes we are basically spiritually embarrassed to find out we believe something wrongly. Either you were taught wrongly or you read it wrongly, or you misinterpret it wrongly. But there's a lot of things about the Bible that when we study and we find the truth on it, people find fault and they're too embarrassed. That's like, listen to me, there are people that will sit in church service week after week after week that do not know for sure they are saved or not. They have doubts. They have questions. They, they don't have assurance. But they are too proud. They are not willing to admit the fact, 
I may have never been saved. They rather die and go to hell than stand in front of a church and say, Church, I'm a church member, but I'm not a member of the body of Christ. I've never been born again. But I see that now, I hear that now, and that tonight I put my faith, or today I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for me on Calvary. Rather than say that, there are people that say, Well, I just can't. What would those people think? Who cares? Who cares? Because listen to me, at the judgment seat of Christ, if they do care, they probably won't be there anyway. Amen? You're, you should be more concerned with what Christ thinks than what people think. And by the way, that doesn't hold water anymore either because everybody is into do your own thing. Do your own thing. And then, as I was growing up, we used to have this expression, James, I don't care if it hair lips. What they meant was, you know, you can say that and not cuss. I don't, I don't give a hair. What we say is, I'm going to do this. I don't care what you think. And basically, that's what people do nowadays. But when it comes to church things, we're afraid of people. Man, there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about the fear of man bringeth a snare. Now what I'm saying is, in this church doctrine, in this gap during this time, God is calling out His bride. Remember the story and the scriptural background. Well, let me just give it to you quickly. In the Old Testament, the Father would arrange... For, I've lost something, there it is, would arrange for a wedding. And they'd get a bride for the son. Remember that story? And then the son would go to prepare a place for the bride, and at a certain time he would come back, and people would go before the son to announce he's coming, and the son would come and get the bride and take her away. When you understand church doctrine, Bible doctrine, biblical history, what happened when Jesus died, he went back to heaven. God had purposed and God had planned. He wanted his son to have a bride. When Jesus went back to the heaven, in other words, now we're stepping into this, we also step into the book of Acts. Now keep in mind, this has been Old Testament Right here during this time, you have the ministry of John the Baptist, but then you have the ministry of Jesus, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we're moving into the book of Acts, which is a transition just like a bridge from the Gospels to the uh, Pauline epistles. Everybody follow me so far? Now, during this bridge, we find out because Paul was given the teaching and the truth and the mystery of the church. The church is the bride of Christ. God has promised His Son a bride, so when Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down. Everybody say amen. amen. When the Holy Spirit came down, He's going about knocking on the hearts and doors of individuals, inviting them to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And when people do, when they are saved, born again, they become part of the body of Christ, the family of God, the church of the living Lord. Now then, there's coming a time when the last soul has been saved. When God says it's time to draw the curtains. Jesus is up here in heaven. He comes down right here and he calls out of the church all those that are his. Didn't say he'd call out all of a church member. If you hear last Sunday night, you would have heard that. He didn't call out people to just say, I have a church membership. He didn't call out people of a church. He called out people of the church. The church is his church. See, a lot of times churches here on earth are people's church. They run it. They control it. And uh, that's why at the end of the Revelation you find Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He would like to get into the church, but the people are satisfied to have him on the outside. Say amen. amen. Anyway, he comes back in the rapture and he calls out the bride of Christ. So what's left on earth 
is unbelieving, or unbelieving people that thought they were Christians and then other unbelievers that didn't profess anything. But there's also Jewish people that are left behind because they're in blindness. They're in darkness. They rejected Jesus Christ over here. So now there are still people today, Jewish people, that say the Messiah hasn't come. So after the rapture, there's three or four things that take place. I know that and I've taught that, but what I'm saying is after the rapture, at a certain point, we come into another week. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Notice what it says right here. And he, the he there is the Antichrist. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. A week is how many years? So that one week or that seven years, oops, I need two screens, is the 70th week of Daniel. It's the tribulation period. And in the midst of the week, the midst means the middle, the middle is halfway, in three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, halfway through, go back to the picture if you would now. Halfway through, I tell you what, go to the last picture, number three. Let's go to number three. Halfway through, it says three and a half years right there. There's the middle of the set. Halfway through, the Antichrist turns his back upon the Jewish people. See, at the beginning, right here, he makes a, an agreement. He signs a covenant, says, hey, I will protect you. I'm in your corner. I've got your back. Nothing else will happen to you. You can rebuild your temple. You can go ahead and have your sacrifices. You can go ahead and worship like you used to. I've got your back. And for three and a half years, the Jews think it's utopia. They think, man, a lie. It couldn't get any better than this. But at the halfway point, during this time, let me just say this much at this point. The Antichrist has been busy. He's been whipping up on nations. He's been working with the one world church. He's establishing the one world government. He's getting everything together. He has become the leading power and he comes in, goes into the temple, sits on the throne, declares himself to be God and the false prophet makes an image of the Antichrist and they said people are going to have to bow down and worship this. And in fact, we're going to make them take something in their right hand and in their forehead. And if they don't have that, they can't buy and they can't sell. I am not talking about the vaccine on what I'm about to say. So I say that to preference those that are half asleep. I'm not talking about the vaccine, but listen to me, I will say this now. Some people have said, I just don't think they can make it to where they can mandate that you have to have a here or here to buy or sell. It's getting that way with the vaccine. You can't go in and shop. You can't, it's going to be you can't ride an airplane. You can't go in this store and buy groceries. You can't go here and you can't. It's becoming a chaotic mess. Regardless of which side of the fence you're on, it don't make any difference to me. What I'm trying to say is, we are being preconditioned. We are being preconditioned to where the government can tell us what to do. The government can make mandates, they can come up with things and say, you got to do this, you got to do that. And when it keeps happening without the people doing something, amen, we need a big Boston 52 state tea party, amen. I didn't say that. But the same way that they can make the laws to determine what you can do now is the way it's going to be during the tribulation. So during this three and a half thing, he's going to order the, the uh, sacrifice to stop. He's going to turn on the Jews. He's going to start killing the Jews. That's the halfway point. And that's what the scripture means. He's going to make a covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading abominations, in other words, He's just going to literally make all hell break loose. I'm not trying to be ugly, but it's going to be like hell on earth for the second three and a half years. There's going to 
be a lot of death and a lot of turmoil and a lot of bloodshed for the Jew. Now then, let's go back and I want to show you something. When this happens, after the rapture, after that covenant has been signed, the clock has started ticking. That means history has seven years of the Antichrist to deal with. Now, at some point there will be the thousand year reign of Christ, but now we're talking about the 70th week. It started ticking again. Now, if we understood everything I said up to now, uh, we'll just leave that picture up there. Let me show you something. I wish I'd drawn this on here now. The rapture happens here. Right over here, at the end of it, Christ comes back. That's called the second coming. This is the rapture. That's the second coming. Now, from here to here, let's use the bottom line. Let me show you something. I believe without stretching any iota, let me show you something. From here to here has already been approximately 2,000 years. 2,000 years of history is in this gap. I believe we're somewhere right along there. What I'm saying is, with all the scripture, with all the characteristics, and with everything the Bible talks about the rapture, I believe we are right here at the rapture. Would you agree with that? Amen. Now then, because of that, then, here again, 69 weeks have been fulfilled, 2,000 years have taken place, and as far as Daniel's prophecy, there's seven years left. When will the clock start ticking? I don't mean I'm asking you now what event. I'm saying how soon are we to the rapture and the clock starting again? Nobody knows. But if it's been 2,000 years, if 69 weeks have been fulfilled, how much time to the rapture, how much personal time do we have left? Not much. And we do not like to think in terms of death. We do not like to think in terms of calamity. If you're here and you're not a Christian, it would be a calamity. Because when the rapture happens... People ask the question, Brother Wayne, do you think there will be people saved after the rapture? Yes. But it's not going to be a big tent revival when they say, hey, come because the rapture happened. If you'd like to receive Jesus, come. It won't be like that. When the rapture happens, I don't think anyone can describe what the world will be like. No one can describe. And I think... The effects were, are going to vary from parts of the country to parts of the country because of population, because of where there's refineries, where there's a lot of electrical grids. Y'all see what I'm saying? Where there's gas. Things like this are going to cause explosions. Where there's airports, there's going to be crashes. Where there's a lot of cars and interchanges, there's going to be wrecks. Where there's hospitals, there's going to be chaos. I mean, there's no way we can picture and emphasize how it's going to be. Now, there may be a few people that when it happens, real quickly recognize that some of the people they see that are missing, they believe to be Christians, and they'll recognize what's happened, and they may fall on their knees and ask God for mercy. But on the other hand, let's back up to everything I just said. I'm not trying to paint a graveyard story, but I'm trying to face reality. They may be in that congested mess on the, on the uh, freeway and at wreck. Or they may be on an airplane that crashes. Or a train that derails. Or a boat that the tsunami is taken down. Or, see what I'm talking about? They can be in hundreds of places where things happen so fast. Take 9-11. We've all seen the pictures. How the building came down. What all is going to happen? We don't know. But my point is, you might be in one of those situations to where you don't have time to think and realize, hey, this may be the rapture and I need to boom. It's too late. Boast not, Proverbs says, thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. 
Corinthians says, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to be saved. Now then, hopefully the pictures make plain what I tried to explain last week. So we talked about there were 483 years from here to here. There are seven years left of the prophecy. But in the meantime, there's been 2,000 years for the Father to get the Son's bride. Let me ask you this question. Are you in the bride of Christ? Are you in the church of the living Lord? Have you been born again? If you have, what you've got to look forward to is a rapture. But what if you're not a Christian? You've got to look forward to the Antichrist and to the tribulation period. You've got to hope that if it happens and you're not a Christian, you're in a situation that you can rationally realize what's happened and rationally make a decision to accept Jesus Christ. But I can't promise that and you can't either. On the other hand now, what about those that are saved? I'm trying to help you to understand. Sometimes we shy away from prophecy and we say, I can't understand. There's, there's more things about total Bible prophecy that probably I don't understand than I understand. But each time I go through that that I understand, as it becomes more clear to me, it makes me want to know more things. Some people say, well, I think we need to be studying this and this and so and so. Oh, you're right, and we need to get around to it. But we need to understand where we are as a world and what we're facing, what our future is like. And if you look at this thing, if we was on the other side of the 2,000 years, even then they didn't know how long they had. But we've had 2,000 years of the church age, but how much more do we have? Let me just throw a little hint at you. Nobody knows today. Nobody knows the time. But if you look at dispensations and if you look at how God counts time, we're getting ready to close out the sixth period of time and go into the seventh. You say, what are you talking about? Another time, another message. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, we invite you to come and accept Jesus Christ. If you're here and you are a Christian, maybe God has just challenged you. It's time to begin to really live for God. It's time for you to get serious about your Bible study, about the things of God. However God is speaking, we're going to pray, we're going to sing. The invitation will be open. This altar is open. If you just want to come to the altar, or if you need somebody to pray with you, however you come, we'll be there to meet you. Father, take the message. Speak to hearts. Have your will and your way in the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.